Okay. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Cam. Are, can you guys hear me in the back? Yes. Okay. Yes, well, I was in San Diego. My wife and I were in San Diego from um, 80 to 89, and then went to Mount Sinai in New York. We were there for 26 years. So my wife keeps telling people that it only took us 26 years to get back to California. Because we tried a couple of times, and this one worked. And I'm just incredibly happy to be here. So, as Cam said, I'm going to talk to you about life and death of neurons in the aging brain. And one of the major points we'll make is the distinction between cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease, which is a, an area that I know everybody in this room, except perhaps that young girl there, <laughs> is interested in. So I'd like to start with Shakespeare. Probably the best description in the English language of somebody who is somewhere between cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease. I fear I am not in my perfect mind. He thinks I should know you and know this man. Yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is, and all the skill I have remembers not these garments. Nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me. <laughs> King Lear, analyzing his own mind and his own behavior. What I like best about this, and it really is the best description I've ever seen, is do not laugh at me. Because that shows a certain level of self-awareness that makes you wonder, just where King Lear is on the cognitive aging to Alzheimer's disease transition. I, I actually think it's early Alzheimer's myself. <laughs> there, are whole, there are whole books written about this. <laughs> so when most people, I think this is a fairly sophisticated crowd, but when most people think about the brain, they think about this three to four pound thing in their skull. But the essence of brain structure and function occurs at the level of circuits. Individual nerve cells that we call neurons and the point of communication between neurons we call synapses. That's the essence of brain function. And that's depicted in this very old cartoon that I love. <laughs> you don't want too many of these. This is early Alzheimer's. It's not connected to anything. But it is kind of, even though it's funny, it, it's, it's really connectivity in the brain that matters. So, We'll get right now into the um, distinction between Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline. So many of us will experience memory problems and mild cognitive problems as we age. Not all of us, and not at the same rate. You have people that are 90 years old that are performing like 35 year olds. So it's highly variable. But Alzheimer's disease is different. Let's first define cognition. We, we have a really good intuitive sense of what memory is. And one of the key brain structures that mediates memory is the hippocampus, and I'm sure you've probably read about that. But their cognition's a little bit more difficult to get an intuitive feel for. It. And it's regions like the prefrontal cortex that are critically important for cognition. And here are some of the functions, and these will be very familiar to you. Working memory. Not the memory of events, but working memory. So something that you're holding in your mind in order to perform a task. One thing that's often used is hold, holding a phone number in your mind. But it's actually much more complicated than that. Um, thinking, intellectual work, ability to reason, planning. Planning is a really important part of what the prefrontal cortex does. How you plan the next minute, how you plan the next hour, how you plan your day. Um, guided goal direct, guiding goal-directed behavior and executive function. That may be the single most important thing the prefrontal cortex does. If you know you want something, you have to figure out how to get it. And the prefrontal cortex does that. And then instructs the body on how to carry out that plan. Or instructs the rest of the brain to instruct the body on how to carry out that plan. For instance, the prefrontal cortex does not project to any of your muscles. <coughs> it's the spinal cord, and that's driven by the motor cortex. But it tells the motor cortex how to, get, how to move and get what you want. Uh, tending to significant events. That one's self-explanatory, and insight, a sense of self, and our internal construct of reality. Those are the issues that we would put under the rubric of, of uh, cognition. So what is dementia? Well, it's the loss of this. It's the loss of memory built up over a lifetime of experience. That's from the hippocampal damage. It's the loss of our sense of who we are, our place in the world, and who you are. That's why at the end you can't recognize your family the loss of ability to interpret what is going on and use that information, and the loss of our ability to think, reflect, reason, and respond appropriately. That's, this is Alzheimer's disease, which is the main cause of dementia. 
<coughs> now, Alzheimer's disease is accompanied by tangles and plaques. You've probably seen them, and you'll see an example in a minute. And neuron death. This is very, very important. There's extensive neuron death in Alzheimer's disease. It's not random. It's certain circuits that die. We'll talk about that in a minute. And so the neuron death leads to a disconnection of those circuits. In normal aging, and even with significant cognitive decline, you do not have significant neuron death. It's a different, it's a different process that's going on. So that's very important. The cortical circuits that are required for memory and cognition deteriorate. Cortical regions end up isolated and disconnected, and they can no longer function in a complex set of circuits. But cognitive aging is not caused by that, as I just said. It's caused by what we would call a loss of synaptic health, the health of your synapses. And I'll, I'll provide two examples of that. So here is classic Alzheimer's pathology, plaques and tangles. How many of you have seen pictures of this before? Yeah. And then I, I noticed that some of the students were showing it on the microscope out there. So the Alzheimer's researchers are divided into Baptists and Taoists. <laughs> and I have never been a Baptist, but I'm getting more interested because there's a whole new level at which amyloid beta protein is supposed to cause problems, and it's at the synapse. And this comes from people thinking that beta amyloid protein is the key versus people that think that tau protein is the key. Tau at least is in dead neurons. These are all these all used to be healthy neurons, and now they're essentially dead with tau accumulating in those neurons. This, the plaque is a more amorphous um, structure. It does have uh, nerve fibers in it, and it does disrupt circuitry, but not to the same degree that tangles do. So here's a, uh, a healthy neuron in red, and here's this green one is now a tangle. And this neuron at some point, as Alzheimer's progresses, will also develop a tangle because of the, of the where it is in the brain, it's in the prefrontal cortex. And this is a plaque, and you can see red nerve fibers going <coughs> into the plaque and being disrupted. So they both disrupt cortical circuits. The tangles more fundamentally, and the, the number of tangles you have correlates more directly with your level of cognitive decline. And tangles appear very early in the hippocampus, disrupting memory. In fact, most people over 55 have at least a couple of tangles in one particular area of the hippocampus. But, they, but there's no functional result from it. And it doesn't necessarily go to Alzheimer's. It's an interesting thing we have to figure out. But when you get full-blown dementia, you've disrupted circuits that go outside of the hippocampus. If you disrupt the hippocampus, it's really going to be a memory defect. If it's the kind of dementia I described a little earlier, you have to have the neocortex involved in areas like temporal lobe and prefrontal cortex. And you'll lose, of the neurons that project, let's say, from prefrontal cortex to temporal lobe, at some point in the development of Alzheimer's, you lose about 80% of those neurons. <coughs> so what happens is these, this is the, these are visual circuits that mediate vision. This goes into the, these pink areas, what we call uh, supramodal areas. In other words, that's where all the modalities conver converge. And they're connected to each other from these lines. And those are the circuits that are really vulnerable to uh, degeneration. So you have a diagram here showing tangles in the cell bodies, plaques disrupting the terminals, and so this circuit from temporal lobe to prefrontal cortex ends up badly disrupted in Alzheimer's disease. See, oh, there. So it goes away. And it literally pretty much goes away, those connections in severe Alzheimer's, where the visual system is affected less to a lesser degree. And if you look at an Alzheimer's patient, they can still see. So, we describe the dementia of Alzheimer's, uh, and it results in the inability of cortical regions to function together as a cohesive system. All of your different <coughs> cortical areas are firing and communicating with each other constantly, and especially the association areas. So complex thought requires complex circuitry, and this is not possible once those cortical connections deteriorate. But why can't I remember what I was going to do today? Remember we said the prefrontal cortex is very much involved in the plan. I actually remembered I was giving this talk. <laughs> but how often does this happen? <laughs> what did I want from the refrigerator? Of course, I, my problem is that's what happened to me since I was about 10. <laughs> so, this is a prefrontal function. It isn't that he 
isn't remembering life's events. It's that he can't remember why he decided to go to the refrigerator and get something. That's classic prefrontal cortex. <coughs> and these are the functions that we just talked about that uh, suffer with age. Now, we're not talking about Alzheimer's anymore. The rest of this, I'm going to be talking about what we think is the, what's happening in the brain that leads to cognitive decline that's way short of dementia. What are the real world implications of this? Hard to alter your daily routine, learn, routine, learning new strategies. I think it's difficult when people move and they have to learn the way around a, a new town, for example, or even a new neighborhood, or even in some respects a new house. Managing medications and following health care instructions, keeping track of finances and paying bills, this often becomes a problem. <coughs> Scheduling and keeping appointments, efficiency in the home, and social interaction. We're going to hear at the very end of the talk how important social interaction is to maintaining your cognitive abilities. But it's a vicious cycle because as there's cognitive decline, you end up being a little bit socially isolated. So this is a very close colleague of mine, Peter Rapp. I think he put it very well when he's talking about prefrontal decline. In short, what suffers is the ability to organize daily activities effectively on the basis of stored information. In other words, working with memory. Okay, here's my favorite picture. This is a nerve cell, a neuron. And we have started to use this term synaptic health over the last several years. It, first of all, it's more optimistic. I'd rather talk about synaptic health and the loss of synaptic health than synaptic decline as our object of study. Because what you really want to do in the end is retain synaptic health. So there are structural molecular profiles of the synapses serving a given circuit or region, such as prefrontal cortex that are required for proper function. Deviation from that profile compromises synaptic health, and that leads to functional decline. So this may be a little synaptocentric, but it's pretty much the case that you really have to keep your synapses healthy to remain cognitively healthy. This is a nerve cell um, that's been loaded with a fluorescent dye. It's only part of the nerve cell. These dendrites, these processes here, these branches are dendrites. This is the axon that's headed off to some place like the temporal lobe to communicate with that area. All these bumps are what we call spines. This neuron has about 10,000 of those spines. That one neuron. And every one of these spines receives an excitatory synapse. Every one of them. So when this neuron talks, it's the result of the convergence of 10,000 inputs. There's also inhibitory inputs. They don't go to the spine, they go elsewhere. There's also modulatory inputs, like you've probably heard of serotonin and norepinephrine. But the key is these excitatory inputs to these spines. So here's a, a diagram of synapse. This represents the spine that I was just talking about. And there are postsynaptic receptors there. These are proteins that respond to the neurotransmitter which is released from the presynaptic side, <coughs> comes across the cleft, excites the receptors, that sends a signal to the rest of the neuron, and if there are enough of those, the neuron will fire. And I won't go into the rest of this. There's, here's these vesicles that contain the transmitter. Transmitter is released. Dendritic spine uh, is excited. We've already said it's the essential element of communication. We have hundreds of billions of these. I mean, we have trillions of these. Some are very stable. Some synapses really don't change, probably for most of your life. Synapses in the visual cortex are probably, there are some in there that are so stable that they essentially don't change. There are synapses in other places, like the prefrontal cortex, that are incredibly plastic, changing all the time. And there are thousands, they're not two, there are thousands of proteins here that are responsible for that signal. Thousands. It's this is probably the most complex structure in the body. Plasticity alter alters those molecules and also alters the structure. Plasticity can be because the spine changes or it can be because these proteins move out of the synapse. And plasticity declines with age. And I'll try to explain why. So this is a real neuron, again, loaded with fluorescent dye. All these bumps are spines. 
if you take that spine and blow it up and put the, the uh, terminal there, up at the top left is, do I have a, I have a pointer? Yeah. Up here would be the terminal. Let me just go back to that. So that would be this. These spines are this. So here's a real synapse at 60,000 time magnification. And here's the dendrite going right into the screen. Here's the spine coming out, one of these spines. And here's the axon terminal coming in. And you can always tell a synapse because of this dark line, which we call the postsynaptic density. So this is a real synapse. This is a real neuron in, in layer three of prefrontal cortex from a monkey. And these neurons play an unbelievably important role in cognitive processing. As I said, each one has about 10,000 spines, some stable, some plastic. These synapses are modified in the context of learning and memory. Hopefully you're experiencing such modifications right now. <laughs> if you take something away from this lecture, your auditory cortex will have been altered to some degree, but your prefrontal cortex will have really been altered. And your hippocampus. But it's happening right there at the synapse. These synapses are tremendously active. And we can study them. We can study them many different ways. You'll probably hear about some electrophysiology. Um, we study them in the microscope. And we can determine which damage and which changes lead to cognitive decline. Okay, so here's a, um, these are reconstructed neurons from a young, a prefrontal cortex of a young monkey, prefrontal cortex of an aged monkey. And these spines can be divided into two, three types, but let's, let's talk about mushroom spines, these big mushroom spines, and what we call thin spines. We can reconstruct these neurons from behaviorally characterized monkeys, so then we can relate the synaptic characteristics back to what correlates with high performance <coughs> versus what correlates with decline. Each spine can be identified and counted and categorized. The thin spines we know are highly plastic and linked to learning. Other spines are very, very stable. And so we can do these quantitative analyses and show which spines are changing, how they link to cognitive performance. This is a blow up of that, those same young and aged neurons. Right away you can see that in the aged, the neuron from the aged animal, there's a 33% loss of spines on these neurons. That's a lot. But if you divide them into categories, it turns out that all of that loss is of thin spines. So 50% of the thin spines are lost. That same spine class, I'm not going to show the data today, is protected by estradiol. When we give a, a monkey that doesn't have circulating estrogen estradiol in a cyclical fashion, we can, we can dramatically decrease the loss of these thin spines. The loss of those spines and the degree to which the monkey loses those spines, and I'm, I'm sure it's the same in human, is highly correlated with cognitive decline. Monkeys that retain these, this class of spines retain their cognitive performance and vice versa. So there's an age-related loss of what I would call structural plasticity. Remember I said proteins can move in and out of the synapse? That also is affected with age. But this is a loss of structural plasticity. <coughs> the mushroom spines are preserved, and we know that mushroom spines have to do with expertise in very, very highly trained and highly stable circuits. So the fact that the cell biology professor can give a totally lucid professor, but forget where his totally lucid lecture, but forget where his car is, is because he's still got his mushroom spines, but he's lost a few thin spines. <laughs> this is the key. We know that these synaptic alterations will precede Alzheimer's disease in humans. So you really have to target this level of change. You can't bring dead neurons back. But we don't know how these synaptic alterations leave a neuron vulnerable to, uh, to, to generation, and we don't know why they, they don't also. In other words, sometimes a personal transition to Alzheimer's, most of the time they won't. So that's an important thing to understand. Now I'm going to, I'm really move, getting you guys very much into neurobiology now, because I don't want to talk about mitochondria. People, you all know what a mitochondria is, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a sophisticated group. <laughs> So there's these activity loops in prefrontal cortex. So these neurons innervate each other. And you can imagine that's how you hold a thought in prefrontal cortex. But it's tremendously energy demanding. 
So mitochondria can move throughout the neurons. See, they just appeared there. And they accumulate at the synapse. Why? Because synapses demand enormous amounts of energy. Presynaptic mitochondria can promote neurotransmission by accelerating the recovery. So you see now it's firing in a much more robust fashion. And that's going to be dependent on mitochondria at the synapse. And again, now you're looking at a real electron micrograph, about 60,000 X again. And all these little guys are mitochondria. And almost every axon terminal has one to several mitochondria. So they are critically important to the function of the synapse. This is a three-dimensional, we took electron micrographs, so very, very thin sections like the one I just showed you. And then we looked at a whole sequence of them, put them together in a 3D reconstruction. So what you have here is you have, this is a dendritic shaft, this is a spine, and this is a terminal. And you see that it's only the terminals that have mitochondria. Mitochondria are in dark blue. The shafts also have mitochondria, but the, but the spines don't. So these, this is a big, long mitochondria right here. And these are mitochondria internals. This guy's bad news. It turns out that donut-shaped mitochondria, and we know that this is, what we're looking at is the morphology, but we know that that represents a damaged mitochondria that will increase reactive oxygen species and also will decrease energy production. And the more straight ones, healthy ones you have, the better your performance, or the monkey's performance is on this task. And the more donut-shaped mitochondria and synapses you have, the worse the monkey's performance is on this task. So this summarizes both findings. So you learn two reflections of synaptic health just now. Here, when you go from good working memory to poor working memory, you're going from a nice abundant set of thin spines to less thin spines. You're also going from nice straight mitochondria with lots of vesicles and a fairly wide synapse to donut mitochondria with fewer vesicles releasing transmitter and a smaller synapse. And smaller synapses have less strength. So this is part of what we think is going on in aging and part of what leads to, to cognitive decline. This, both of these, both the donut-shaped mitochondria and the thin spines can be protected in our experiments by estradiol treatment. Okay, I'm about done. Pretty much on time. Um, so we know synaptic alterations lead to age-related cognitive decline. We've been, we've been able to identify in the non-human primate studies vulnerable circuits and, and synapses. But we need to be able to link those to synaptic health in the human. So we need to know when you do imaging in the human, what, how does that imaging, how do those imaging data reflect what's happening at the synaptic level? We don't know that yet. And the monkey would be an important model to figure that out. We know we can, this is pretty maybe the most important point of the whole talk. We know that we can protect vulnerable synapses. We know that from our estradiol data. We don't know yet what else we can use to protect those vulnerable synapses, but I'm sure we can tap into that same signal. And I've already said this, intervening in early Alzheimer's is too late. Uh, the neuron death is already widespread. These synaptic alterations likely precede the neuron death, so you really have to preserve and promote synaptic health. Um, I was fortunate enough to be on a uh, panel, an Institute of Medicine panel on cognitive aging in 2015. Um, a book came out of it, but also this summary of that book came out of it, Cognitive Aging, Progress and Understanding and Opportunities for Action, and this action guide for individuals and families. You can download these if you go to the IOM site, but also if you send an email after this, this symposium, uh, who, who will that go to? Would that go to Jennifer? Uh, Jennifer Scott will be. Oh, okay. Or send an email to me. Because I've provided these documents to the Center for Neuroscience, but you can also send an email to me and I'll send you both these documents. Just quickly, here's some of the recommendations that came out of it. Be physically active. Reduce and manage cardiovascular disease risks. So this is linked to uh, brain health. Review these conditions and medications with your healthcare, healthcare provider that might be affecting cognition. Um, be socially and intellectually engaged. This is tremendously important. Sleep is very important. If you have a sleep disorder, get treatment for it. If you're hospitalized for surgery, try to avoid delirium if you can. 
Because delirium is a very serious risk for cognitive What's that? What's delirium? Delirium is... Uh, delirious? Yes, it's, it's a confused state, a very seriously confused state, where the person can basically no longer communicate and, have, and has serious cognitive <coughs> defects. And it's thought to be temporary. But you will then come out of that um, once you recover from anesthesia, for example. But now it looks as if there may be more permanent cognitive risks with delirium. Yes. How do you avoid it? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> well, I mean, it's caused by metabolic changes, yeah. infections. So basically, if you're ill, get, get care quickly. Don't wait until you're really sick and out. And I, I would say another thing. Cam may or may not agree. If you can avoid general anesthesia, <coughs> avoid it. <laughs> I mean, I've had nine surgeries, eight orthopedic surgeries, and I, the last five, I didn't have general anesthesia. Video games, antioxidants, metabolic health, in other words, avoiding type 2 diabetes, all probably will help as well, but the data for these aren't quite as strong in human trials. What's your email?